There's just two weeks until the first budget of the Labour government, but already we're hearing about cabinet disagreements, imminent tax rises, cuts in public spending. What will our audience here make of it all? Tonight we are in Rotherham in South Yorkshire. Labour have dominated this town for nearly a century and it was one of the biggest pro-Brexit areas in the country. But tonight's audience, as always, reflects the electoral picture across the nation. Welcome to Question Time. On the panel from the government, Douglas Alexander has been a senior member of the Labour Party for nearly 30 years, serving in the cabinets of Blair and Brown. He has returned to Parliament in the summer as MP for Lothian East and is now Business and Trade Minister. Damien Green had a long period in Parliament and government after being elected as a Conservative MP for Ashford in 1997. He served in the David Cameron government before rising to Deputy Prime Minister under Theresa May. He lost his seat in the July election. Steve Rigby is an entrepreneur and investor. His company, Rigby Group, has a revenue of nearly £4 billion and employs over 9,000 staff. He also has a business column in The Times. The lecturer and journalist Ash Sarkar is contributing editor at the left-wing website Novara Media. She released her first book last year, Minority Rule, which examines the so-called... Out next year. Out next year, forgive me. Out next year, she examines the so-called culture wars. Thank you, Ash. And the commentator, satirist and writer Constantine Kissin co-hosts the Free Speech podcast podcast and YouTube show Trigonometry, which it says is about honest conversations with fascinating people. And we'd love to have some of that tonight, please. Good evening. Welcome to our panellists. Welcome to our audience here in Rotherham. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. And I just want to say, uh, you'll have seen that Scotland's uh, former First Minister, Alex Salmond, died suddenly at the weekend. And he was, he was always a formidable Question Time panelist. He made more than 30 appearances. His first was in 1987 alongside Ken Clark and Dennis Healy. And his last was just in May this year uh, in Aberdeen. So we just want to say from Question Time that our sincere condolences go to his family and his friends. Right, let's get this programme started. We'll take our first question, which is from Steve Ridley. Given reports the government needs to find about 40 billion to start to fix our public services, should they raise taxes? cut spending or just borrow the money? Right, well, Douglas, as we have you here from the government, so uh, let's just talk about the figures for a minute. So originally it was 22 billion uh, was missing from the government's finances. Now they need to find 40 billion. Which is it and, and why? The 40 billion figure I've seen appear in the newspapers, it's not a figure that as the government we've been using, we have been using that 22 billion pound figure. So because, we're not going to be seeing that a couple of weeks' time, the well, chance of standing up saying actually it's 40 billion. As you just read out, I'm the trade minister, not a treasury minister. No, but and you're I'm here not representing going to, I'm the not government. going to write the budget this evening. We're going to have to just wait a couple more weeks, only one more show, until all those questions are answered. But in terms of what we discovered when we came into office, it was honestly worse than we expected. Let me give you one practical example from the department that I'm in, the Department of Business and Trade. We all know about the Horizon scandal in terms of postmasters. There was literally no provision in the departmental budget to pay the sub-postmasters the compensation they're entitled to. So what we've seen is a government that's made all kinds of spending promises without allocating any money towards it, and that's why we're facing that black hole. So how do we deal with it? Firstly, we need to establish economic stability. We've passed an Economic Responsibility Act to make sure that we don't see the kind of repetition of Liz Trust when she crashed the economy with her mini-budget. We've been working hard at the figures. We do need to bring fiscal stability, making sure the books balance. But on the other hand, we've also held this week a new international investment summit that has secured about 38,000 new jobs for the UK, brought in £63 billion worth of new investment. So that's why the government's mission is both stabilise the economy and deliver growth. Because well, getting back to the question, which is, should the government raise taxes, cut spending or borrow money, what about this uh, report that several cabinet ministers have, have, have gone over the Chancellor's head and written directly to the Prime Minister, expressing concerns about cuts in their department? That is is that true? That is a non-story, if you want to... In well, no, hang on. Single, is, I'm every... asking, is it true, not well, is it a non-story? I haven't story? seen the correspondence, but I no, can tell you... No, I'm not asking if you've seen the correspondence. I, is it true? Well, I can tell you, in every spending round, every cabinet minister fights for their department. Okay, so is it so true or not? if it's true... 
it's of massive inconsequence because every minister okay, is going to be negotiating with the Treasury so formal saying, I want from money for pensions the Prime or business or education. Is it, come on, is it true or not? As I say, I haven't seen the correspondence. But no, I'm not asking you that. I'm not saying, have you seen the letters? I would is be it true? deeply unsurprised if it is true. I haven't seen the correspondence. I'm no, not no, 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 that's not the question. Is it true or not? Is what true? Have these letters gone to the Prime Minister or not? I don't know. You don't know? OK, well, that's where we're getting there. Damien. Um, the, the, I mean, to go back to the original question, the 22 billion figure was made up, the 40 billion figure uh, is made up as well. Uh, Rachel Reeves is just uh, trying to find excuses to put taxes up uh, because that's what Labour governments do. Well, hang on, uh, the Conservative uh, government had a very good go at raising yeah, taxes, absolutely. the <laughs> highest tax state since the Second World War. And, and it's going to get worse now. That's the interesting thing. Uh, that, uh, and the government that says, I, I mean, we've already seen it, we're, we're getting all these rumours that. Uh, employers' national insurance is going to go up. It is explicit in the Labour manifesto that they are not going to put national insurance up. They apparently are going to break uh, that promise. Uh, they, there are all sorts of other tax rises uh, being put about. And, uh, I mean, Douglas makes, makes the point that, you know, that the central purpose of this government is supposed to be to promote growth. And who could object to that? It's motherhood and apple pie. You don't promote growth by putting business taxes up in your first budget and spending some of your first hundred days saying that the economy is in a terrible state and will never recover. But They've hang on, the Conservative government put up national insurance contributions, employer and employee. Yeah, for, for, this, for very specific purposes. We also cut... But you say, so that would be something cut, you support, then? We, we also cut national insurance uh, uh, for, uh, for workers. We cut workers' taxes twice. Um, and, and the government, uh, the Labour Party in opposition, voted in favour of that. They are now going to put employers' national insurance well, up Well, we again. don't know that for sure. Well, we don't know that for sure. Let's see. But it's been... But the other thing is that, that they've done is, apart from putting, threatening to put business taxes up, um, they've stopped North Sea exploration. They've stopped a big AI computer uh, being built. Um, as, as we've heard, we've already got cabinet ministers doing something that is unprecedented, writing to the prime minister on the day the chancellor is is set to so hang on a send minute. the budget. Hang on a minute. We've got someone from the government here saying they don't have history. Are you saying you know that's true? Uh, you're making that. You're saying that is a fact. Is it? Up. Well, I'm making it up on the basis of newspaper reports that clearly oh, came out... Oh, they must be true, then. Well, well, they came out with leaks from cabinet ministers. News OK, now I'm simply asking if you know it's true for a fact. Well, I haven't seen the letters, okay, but, but, so you don't. Just, but it's, it's, it's clearly happening. You're All right, right. right. let's look. Let's, we've got some audience uh, with their hands up. Yes, let's yeah, hear I, I don't understand why it seems to be taken as read that putting up taxes is a bad thing. We have a progressive tax system in this country. If you put up taxes, the, the rich pay more than the poor, and what's wrong with that? OK, put Steve. Up taxes. I think the stark reality is actually the whole is about 87 billion. That's the shortfall on budget this year. So whether it's 22 or 40, the reality is that you were in a position today where we probably did need to raise taxes. And whether that's for a short period of time or whether it's for a longer period of time is yet to be determined. But in reality, spending reviews, reviewing the debt cap of 100% and taxation likely needs some adjustment. And can I ask you, since you're here and, and, and your company employs, I think it's something like 9,000 staff, yeah. one of the things that the government has been talking about and has, has introduced proposals on is workers' rights, yeah. improving workers' rights. Where do you stand on that? We've got the Small Business Federation saying they think it could be very damaging. Yeah. Where do you stand? I think, you know, the workers' rights point is really interesting. During, the, during COVID, I think clearly there was a big transition. The Great Recession happened for, if you like, knowledge workers, white-collar workers. And there was a big shift between uh, employee and employer. And in fact, you know, it, the pendulum swung completely the other way. That didn't affect people that were working in warehouses or supermarkets or hospitals. So I think a rebalancing of workers' rights, much of what's being proposed, I think is sensible. The big issue sits around probation. And, and in reality today, probation is failed 20% of the time. And the main reason is actually for non-attendance. So that, that protection that companies have is very key. So just to be clear, what the government is suggesting, but I think it's going to consult on it, is removing the, the two-year qualifying period for protection from unfair dismissal and rec is recommending replacing it with a statutory probation period. Yes. And you think that could be problematic? The, the danger is, if that goes to six months or possibly nine months, as is indicated, does it force decisions too early? You may not know at that point whether somebody is right or wrong, but your hand may be forced to make a decision. And that's one of the key things that, as we go through this next phase of consultation, we've got to get right. OK. A man in the front here. 
So I'm 16 and therefore fortunate enough not to pay taxes yet. But obviously, even at my age, I know that back in May, there was a cross-party committee report that said that financial education for young people needs to be statutory and compulsory nationwide. I'm a youth MP and I've heard from so many children that they really believe in this. So I want to ask all of you, in a time where money has never been so important, where we've got the budget coming up, we've just emerged from a cost of living crisis, how are we going to ensure that all young people, whether they attend private or state school, receive the statutory financial education that they so desperately require? So you're suggesting it should be part of the national curriculum? Absolutely. At the moment it's advised but not compulsory. Some schools deliver it great, many do not. So it needs to be statutory, compulsory, so it's a one-size-for-all approach. So all children, no matter what demographic, receive the education that they need to take into adulthood. All right, I'm going to come back to you on that, but let's just... I, I will come back to that. Um, Ash, should the government raise taxes, cut spending or borrow money? So I think that Labour really are in a pickle of their own making because going into the election, they said, well, we're not going to hike taxes on national insurance, on income and, I believe, corporation tax as well. Anyone who had eyes to see could predict that what was going to happen next, that they'd get into office and go, oh, we looked under the hood and it's so much worse than we thought it was going to be. And that that would sort of create the political space to introduce some kind of tax rise down the line. Now, the problem with that is that I think it's a dishonest way to do politics. I'm in favour of having tax rises on wealth. I think it's completely backwards that the more you work for your money, the more you get taxed on it. So you get taxed at income at a rate which is higher than you get taxed on for capital gains, and that's still higher than what you get taxed on uh, for inheritance. I mean, you don't earn your inheritance at all. You just have to be in the right place when someone dies. And um, That t seems to me to be a completely um, inside-out way of doing things. We should reward work. Obviously, people on very high incomes should be taxed more, but you should be looking at things like wealth taxes on assets over two million. You should be looking at further windfall taxes. I thought that was a very good idea of Labour's. I mean, I when, it comes, to, when it comes to wealth tax, Zash, as you will know, uh, countries that have introduced wealth taxes, I mean, I've got a list of them here, Austria, Denmark, France, Finland, Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Sweden, they've all dumped theirs. And the only country that's maintained it, which is Switzerland, has a very different tax system. So what makes you think a wealth tax would work? Well, I think the first thing it is hasn't that worked anywhere else. we have got absolutely runaway levels of inequality in this country in a way which isn't comparable to any sure. of those countries that you've just... But if, they don't, but so if that, it doesn't work in so those countries, because basically either people move their money elsewhere, uh, they just, it basically just hasn't, hasn't worked, and that's why they've all rescinded it. But you can also have other measures of preventing that level of capital flight, right? So it's not just that it's the one tool that the Treasury uses, right? You'd look at it as part of a parcel. So we have to succeed where all those countries have failed, I, somehow. I'm an optimist. OK, OK. I think, Asha, there was a word earlier of progressive tax, and I think that's, that's the way to evolve tax. I think moving too far left or too far right isn't the answer, but being progressive in nature, I think, is... But I think it is progressive key. to look at the fact that for lots of people, a passive income, where you're just screaming off profits off the top and you just own stuff, that that's how you get filthy rich. And people who are working, grafting every single day, they're getting taxed at a higher rate. Even Conservative voters look at that and go, that's not fair, that's not right. Yeah. I'll come back here with Constantine. Well, I very much welcome the point the young man made at the front about economic education because one of the things I would achieve is debunking many of the things we've just heard. I mean, <clears> for a start, uh, people don't understand tax. We put tax on things we want to reduce the amount of, things that we want to disincentivize. We put tax on alcohol because we want people to drink less. We put tax on smoking because we want people to smoke less. What do you think happens when you put the taxes up on employment and on business? You get less business and you get less employment. We don't, what we should really be focusing on is how do we grow the economy? We are all poorer per capita, which is the thing that actually matters, than we were in 2007. We have still not grown the economy from that time and still haven't recovered. So what we should be talking about is how do we grow? Now, wealth taxes don't work because rich people leave. That's what they do because they can. And what we should be doing is thinking about how do we boost businesses? How do we create more jobs? How do we boost the opportunities for that? I'm glad the government acknowledged the problem we're in. I think they're right to do so. I'm glad they've also said the country's open for business. The problem is, as we know from all the leaks that you've mentioned earlier, Fiona, they're going to put up taxes on business, and what that will do is stifle economic growth, not boost it. No. Steve, you must have a view on that. Yeah, I think will it st will, yeah, as, as a businessman, do you, are you, do you welcome those? Do you think it will stifle growth? I, I think, you know, it's a, unintended consequences and tax are a real risk. And I think there's a balance you get to, and the balance also starts to get exacerbated when you're layering on multiple taxes. So today, non-DOM changes, carried interest, private equity, capital gains tax, 
the three coming together, you, you don't know what you're in to break. So and what I about think, national insurance contributions for employers as opposed to just for employees? You know, I mean, I, I'm talking for someone that's got 4,500 of our 9,000 people here in the UK. So it's, you know, it's a big consideration for us. There have been two previous changes. So 2003 and 2011 were changes previously, 1% each change. Business absorbed. Uh, and I do feel sorry for the small businesses out there. And if you take the, the private sector workforce, it's about 23 million people. About 15 million work for, for medium or bigger sized businesses. But the smaller businesses are impacted disproportionately. But if you're a fair sized business, 50 employees or more, you probably can absorb 1%. Okay. And if that's what we have to do for the country, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay, woman there with the glasses. Yeah, I just think there should be a recognition that the employer tax um, and change in NIC contributions doesn't just affect businesses, it also affects charities. And this will kill small charities who are having to fill the gaps for our statutory services that aren't funded enough to deliver what the charities are having to do. Um, and there's no discussion about how that it's going to affect both small businesses but small charities as well. Right, Doug, let's come back to you. First of all, to the young man's question there about statutory uh, lessons on, on financial matters. And, and, and then the other points. So you make an incredibly powerful point because I'm a Scottish Member of Parliament. I'm not familiar with the English curriculum, but I'm very happy to take that up with Bridget Phillipson. If you look what Martin Lewis does literally every week in terms of financial education for all of us, I think there's a very powerful case to say how do we make sure, as you say, as a social justice measure, that everybody across society, not just those whose mums and dads get access to financial advice, actually are money smart as they're growing up. It's not a service to young people not to make sure people understand money as they're growing up. Let's move on. Before we do, I just want to say that next week we are heading to Plymouth in the southwest, and the week after that we're in Guildford and Surrey. So if you live in or around Plymouth or Guildford and you'd like to come and be part of the audience, we would love to see you. Uh, you go to our website, here is the address, and you can apply. And then I just want to say also that our, our special debate on the US pres presidential election is also on the iPlayer. It was pretty lively, uh, with some unusual, uh, unusual and frequent use of a particularly choice English expression, which I cannot repeat here since we go out on iPlayer at 8 o'clock. But should you wish to watch? I highly recommend. Anyway, let's take our next question, which is from Robin, Robin White. Would free gym membership be a better option to help overweight people back to work rather than weight loss drugs? Right, so Robin. <laughs> this comes in the context... Uh, obviously, there are weight loss drugs out there, Zempic, Manjaro, we go over a number of them that people are taking, but there is a new NHS trial of 3,000 people in Greater Manchester of one, one particular weight loss drug. And amongst other things, obviously we'll see how it works for them, uh, it will also look at how it affects their employment status, um, how many six days they may take, may they take more or fewer, that kind of thing. Um, Constantine. Well, I think it's a practical, empirical matter. We should find out by doing studies to see what, what works better. The one thing I would hope the government would throw into the mix would be uh, mental health interventions and giving people communication mm -hmm. skills and life skills that are often the barrier between uh, somebody getting a job and holding a job down and also you know mental health issues which are often again a, a problem for people who struggle to to keep a job so but that's how what I would like to see. That, given how how difficult it is for so many people to access mental health care? well that's what I'm saying I think that should be part of the mix as opposed to just throwing jabs at them to, to help reduce weight because yes being obese may be a barrier in some work but in most cases people aren't going to be struggling to find a job because they're obese. There will be other things that are getting in the way. Ash. So I think that something like a weight loss jab, that's a decision for an individual and their doctor. And what worries me is that it's sort of being seen as an arm of the Department for Work and Pensions. And I think that's wholly inappropriate. It's a healthcare decision, right? It shouldn't be a DWP decision. Similarly, there was this um, story being floated where there's a suggestion that jobs coaches could be sent into uh, hospitals where mental health patients are being treated. Again, that's a health setting. It shouldn't be for the DWP. I'm not saying there isn't a role for jobs coaches with mental health patients, but in a hospital, I don't think so. But they I, may not be. I mean, if you're getting this jab, you're very unlikely to be in hospital. You'll, no, 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 you'll be getting your the, jab. The mental and then... health uh, patients, and I'm saying that right. for weight loss jabs, that should just be a decision for individuals and their doctors. I think the bigger picture here is that the benefits bill is projected to go up by a third over the next five years. The reason why is because 14 years of conservative austerity has left us with a poorer and a less healthy country, and those health issues disproportionately impact poorer regions. Now, I think that the Labour Party have unfortunately 
been a bit stush about spending. Unfortunately, this is a very expensive problem. And instead of fixing the leaking roof, it kind of feels like Labour are going, well, let's paint the kitchen instead because that's a bit cheaper. I think that the weight loss jab, I'm scared that it's a bit of a gimmick and it's not going to deal with the underlying problem of the, re the relationships between inequality, poverty and poor health. All right, Robin, let's... let's... <laughs> Let's, Robin, where, where are you? Let's, let's hear from you, because you asked that question, then we'll go to you in, with the glasses, yeah. And actually, I'll just say, the rest of you are all sitting very quietly, but if you want to get your hands up, do. Right, yes. For me, I think just having, uh, whether it's injection or whatever it is, it's just too much of an easy option. And constantly meant and mental health, sort of going, in, going to the gym, uh, doing that, doing cardio, doing weights, uh, for mental health will do far better. Uh, than just taking uh, something and then it's too easy then to just to blame the drug. Oh, is there another drug? Can I have more of the drug? Rather than actually uh, having that sense of pride and achievement uh, of doing it yourself through better diet plus uh, the gym. OK, woman in the glasses. I know that here in we've actually got one of the largest obesity issues in the country. So using like what Ash said about the inequalities between lower income areas and unhealthier eating, that is a big problem that we're facing here but also to build on what robin was just saying using a drug to solve a problem like obesity is like using a drug to solve a problem like depression you have to well, have people people factors. obviously do do use drugs to help with depression yeah absolutely but it's, it shouldn't be something that should be done on its own you should be if you are suffering with something like depression you should be seeking help elsewhere like therapy whether that's in a group setting or in a one-to-one -one setting. I'm not saying administer this drug and send them off to Slimming World. It should be, there should be support consistently through the way, but I can't see that being an economic decision that could be made so simply. Okay. Yes, the, the, um, the man there with a, he got his check shirt on, I think, yeah. We've got an NHS that's um, at breaking point, if we were to believe everybody. We have people waiting years and years for life-changing and life-saving operations. I don't think the NHS should be funding a dietary drug. We've got dietitians who can give people the proper advice. Walk to work. But so far, that's not really worked, has it? I mean, that, 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 that's one argument. People say, you know, the, the level of obesity is increasing, and maybe this is, is, is... I mean, for example, in America, obesity has decreased, I think, for the first time in living memory. Well, they're life choices, aren't they, Fiona? OK, no, absolutely fair enough. That's your view. Douglas. Um, we are eating more as a society and exercising less. That's costing the health service about £11 billion a year. And so I agree with the woman in the audience suggesting we need to be testing every tool in the potential toolkit. For example, we're going to ban junk food adverts until um, after 9 o'clock in the evening so that kids are not watching that. Um, Bridget Phillips in the Education Secretary has announced a pilot of 750 at breakfast clubs for schools so that kids are eating healthily from spring of next year. In that context, as well as looking at whether people should be prescribed to go for exercise to the gym, I think it's right that we did this deal this week with an American company that is going to spend £279 million on a trial simply to establish what are the clinical outcomes of using this drug. Now, in that sense, it's not going to be right for everybody. But if you look at what's happened historically in terms of drug prices, they start very expensive and as they move off patent and become generic, it becomes much cheaper. So actually, given the scale of the crisis we face in terms of obesity, I think it's right we don't exclude any possibility, but we don't limit our ambitions to a single answer. And I don't think anything we've said this week suggests that we see this as somehow removing a personal responsibility or indeed other options that should be available to people in the National Health Service. But coming to the point that, that you made, for example, uh, you're nodding your head there. I mean, you've, you've got something like 200 doctors have written to the health secretary saying that these treatments have led to unprecedented public demand, enormous pressure on the NHS. Given how much pressure the NHS is under, how realistic is there that the kind of talk that Ash is talking about, that you're talking about mental health help, you know, not just giving someone the injection and then off they go, but, but wrap around care to make sure that they are supported through it. How realistic is it that, that So, truthfully, happen? we commissioned Ara Darzi, a surgeon, when we came into office in July to look at the state of the health service and the conclusions were pretty grim. I mean, the health service is broken, but it's not beaten. But that's why we need to be looking at every option for the health service. There are three big reforms that we think need to happen. First of all, we need to digitise the service. So we move from an analogue service to a digital service. Secondly, we need to move from a hospital-focused service to a community-focused service. And thirdly, we need to make sure we're moving from 
treatment to prevention, and that's why it's important we're looking at every option, because okay. the way we make the health service affordable are to make those three big reforms. Women in, in red. Yeah, I work in mental health, and if I told my patients that they, you know, they're obese and they need a weight loss drug, I think it's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, who's going to monitor the side effects of these drugs? Because we know the research is out there. This is a new drug, and we've still not managed to research the side effects of these drugs. So you're thinking about, you know, there's other ways of reducing obesity, and it's not planned. You've not put a lot of thought into this. It's not a quick fix. This is not Labour saying, "Oh, we'll just put a plaster. We'll just put mm. a plaster on this, hoping you know this this problem will go away." I'm sorry to say, but you need to start thinking about. You know, you need to start thinking about where, what is priority. NHS is at bo boiling point. Staff uh, morale is so lowest. It's the lowest it's ever been. <laughs> when are you going to be recognising that? When are you going to be putting money into NHS services? Cancer treatment. You've got a massive waiting list. My brother was 44 and he died. He died of cancer and it's going to be two years in December and it's absolutely disgusting that I'm sitting here and I'm still raising the fact that you really need to get your act together. People have voted Labour and you're saying that it was the highest in Rotherham. Well, you need to start thinking and you need to stop blaming each other because mm. I always think... You, you've just come in and you've said, oh, well, we looked at it and it was Conservatives that made that decision. Well, hang on a minute. Stop blaming each other All and right. start getting your act together. First, <laughs> firstly, I'm genuinely sorry for your loss of your brother. It is the case that the health service is in really bad shape. We've been in office for almost 14 weeks after 14 years where we would say the health service has been really badly run. My mother worked in the health service for 40 years. I'm unyielding in my admiration for the work that the staff have done in really difficult conditions. What do we need to do? We need to deliver on the manifesto commitment we made to have 40,000 extra appointments every single week. And that's why in the budget in a couple of weeks, I sincerely hope we will see a focus on the health service because I'm afraid the tragic experience your family has encountered is far, far too common an experience in the health service today. And we're working night and day to fix that. Man with the glasses there, yes, it's sort of in the middle. Yeah. Um, good luck in this area, getting a doctor's appointment to have your weight loss job. Uh, <laughs> listen, can I ask, is there anyone here either who has taken one of these weight loss uh, jabs or who, or who would want to, who would think it would be a good idea? Yes, you, we heard you from you before, yes, with the glasses, yeah. Um, I think it's more because obesity and being overweight in general is linked to poor mental health. And so it, you think it, if, you, if, if the job jab was offered, not that you need it, I'm just saying for a moment, <laughs> but, but in, in principle, you think that would be a good idea? Um, maybe not society-wide, because, you know, there are people that may struggle with sure. other issues that may lead to but, their but for obesity, some people. but for somebody okay. like myself, yeah, I'd go for it. All right, woman here, a little bit further down at the edge there, yes. There is a wonderful scheme in Rotherham people don't perhaps know about. It's called Rotherham Health Wave, and it's conjunction with the NHS and the council. And if you want to self-refer yourself, you don't need to go to a doctor. You can get 12 weeks of free exercise, swimming, gym, etc. Okay. All and right. That's very important. Uh, yes, the woman at the back, you've got your hand up, you've got your glasses on. Yes. Have you? I can't quite see. Oh, yes, you. Yes, sorry, you haven't got glasses on. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Um, I'm a junior doctor, I work in the NHS, and I was training in Rotherham in my first year of work, and I saw patients who were in their 30s or 40s looking like they'd li lived 60 years of life. <laughs> Um, and obviously lots of problems with obesity, lots of problems who'd gone abroad to have surgery, to help with weight loss, coming in with complications as a result. I think working in the NHS now for four years, I've seen that there's loads of policies aimed at uh, more efficient short-term results and fixes, but actually all, it's, all that's happening is in the short term you might improve certain numbers, you might meet certain targets for an auditing or to prove a point by the end of the election cycle. So, but in is, reality, this, so is this not something you would support then? I think I agree with what Ash said, where it's a conversation between a doctor and a patient, and I think that there are cert certain circumstances in which that's beneficial. I just think that there's always such a short-sightedness when it comes to looking at the NHS. There's a huge problem with staffing. There is, um, it, there's loads of us doctors who actually want to get into training posts and start working, but there's not enough jobs for us to actually start training so that we can then become consultants and we can get enough appointments for people. We don't have enough nurses on the wards. I, I was working in a &E kind of five days in a row, and we were so short-staffed with nurses and patients weren't getting their essential medications on time. And it's an, it, I think, you know, obviously it has to be a holistic conversation, but there's always focus on these very catchy topics that will grab headlines and not focus on how we actually make this healthcare service sustainable for everyone. Okay. I hear you.
Um, Steve, let's just come back to, to one of the things that this trial, uh, and, and, and Ash touched on it, one of the things this trial will look at, and it's going to look at a number of things, but one of the things it will look at is how this drug affects the employment status of a patient, how many sick days they take. I mean, just, again, coming back to you as, as an employer of thousands of people, how interested are you in this? I, th I think ultimately the government, I think, is trying to health, uh, help health outcomes. And you know, prevention has to be the route forward. We can't afford the health service that we have today. Today it's about 8% of our GDP, and it's forecast in the next 50 years to be 15%. And unless we want to all pay you know, huge amounts more taxation, that's not a realistic outcome. So prevention using technology, new medicines, has to be a way forward. So, you know, in terms of incapacity, we, we know that's a big issue today in the UK. We know there's a skill shortage. You add together, you know, the human nature of, of wanting to help people, plus the issues of not working, and we know for mental health that's a very poor, poor outcome. Add those together, and these treatments, they've got to be worth a try. We've got to at okay. least pilot and test. Damien? Um, I think I completely agree with that point, that uh, we have all, throughout the period of the National Health Service, we have underplayed and underspent on prevention as opposed to cure. It's actually a national illness service. It, it gets us better when we're, when we're ill. Well, actually, if you don't get ill in the first place, it's better for you, and obviously it's better for the NHS. Um, three points about obesity in particular. Um, we, we've talked about it as though everyone uh, who is obese um, has some kind of other medical problem, perhaps a mental health problem or something uh, like that. That's, that's not true. So I think those who can uh, improve their lifestyle, basically eat less, exercise more, it's not complex, um, should be encouraged massively to do so. That would be a lot better for them and a lot better for the NHS, which is hard-pressed, obviously. The second thing, the one thing we haven't discussed, um, is our food system, mm -hmm. the food that people find it easy to buy. I think it's really important uh, that we should change that. The way we did with the sugar tax, where actually a lot of drinks have just been reformulated, so they are pumping less sugar into people, particularly children, that's been a huge success. No, everyone said, oh, people got out of business. Nobody's gone out of business, they've just reformulated. There is less sugar uh, going into people. We should do that much more widely and make it much easier for people to buy and eat on a regular basis healthy food that doesn't actually damage them. And the third point is that I think medicalising this problem, i.e. giving people injections on the NHS, should be the last resort, partly because, as, as somebody said, we don't yet know, these drugs haven't been around long enough for us to know what effect they will have if you have to take them year after year. And I am very wary about going down a route that, that, that we don't know uh, the end point of. But there are other things we could be doing now. They're complex things. Changing the food system is not easy. But if we do that, then it's actually a much more sustainable way of making us all healthier and helping people who are okay. obese not to get there in the first place. All right, I'm going to move on and take another question from Ray Irwin. Has Israel gone beyond defending itself? <laughs> so, uh, this comes in the context, obviously, of uh, the war that has been going on for over a year now. On Sunday, the US wrote to Israel, giving it 30 days to boost humanitarian aid access in Gaza or risk having some of its military assistance cut off. And then we learned tonight that the, um, the Hamas leader, Yahya Sinwar, uh, has been killed. Um, Ash, has Israel gone beyond defending itself? I think that we left the parameters of self-defense a very long time ago. Um, 40,000 people in Gaza are dead at least, that's probably an undercount, at least 16,000 children. This week, an independent UN report singled out the destruction of healthcare services in particular and said that Israel could be guilty of the crime of extermination. Israel is facing accusations of genocide at the International Court of Justice. The International Criminal Court also found that Israel uh, had been upholding apartheid and occupation predominantly in the West Bank. This was not about self-defense. It was about using the horrific events of October 7th as an excuse to ethnically cleanse parts of Gaza, to destroy much of the Palestinian population in Gaza, 
and to redraw the regional map so that Israel comes out on top. Well, and let's... The, 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 the key thing about your question is, has Israel gone beyond defending itself, which you clearly feel it has gone way beyond. What would Israel defending itself look like if it hadn't gone too far? What, what, what is that? I think it's a really important question because you have to look at what is most in the interests of civilians, both Palestinian and Israeli. The only way forward would be a negotiated settlement. There was ceasefire for hostages deals on the table as far back as last October. And part of the reason why Netanyahu kept rejecting it is because he thought he could push his part further. And so that has endangered think... Israeli civilians. They've been subject to uh, rocket attacks. It's endangered the lives of those hostages who are still in Gaza. So do, what, do you think... In, 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 in utter savagery What do you think Israel should have done on the 8th of October? I think what they should have done is negotiated for those hostages back and also put or a peace process... negotiate with Hamas yes, and put a on peace the day process. after the attack. Yes, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. And I, can, I can hear you laughing in the background. Nothing that the Palestinians have done has resulted in the advancement of their cause. When they've chosen peaceful means, like the Great March of Return a couple of years ago, Israeli forces opened fire and killed over 200 people. Okay. All right. No, no, I hear what you're saying. But I think, I think this is a really important question because we've talked about the war, of course, rightly, the war going on. But this is not a question that has been asked, and I'm really interested to see what you have to say about it. Constantin. The idea that in the wake of the largest terrorist attack in living memory in Israel and around the world, the solution to that was to negotiate with the people who not only did it, not only murdered th over a thousand people and raped women and took hundreds of hostages and dragged them off, but also have continued to commit themselves to repeating that attack again and again and again. The idea that you could possibly negotiate with these people when they continue to promise to repeat their terrorist attack. The man who was killed today, was appointed to replace the man who was assassinated, who was the previous leader of Hamas, in order to demonstrate the commitment to this. Jeremy Bowen of the BBC just a few days ago interviewed uh, one of the leaders of Hamas who refused to commit to his two-state solution, who refused to so abandon Israel. the cause of terrorism. My point to you is there's an option on the table for Hamas, which is to hand back the hostages they have taken, to withdraw the threat that they have given repeatedly through their various leaders to repeat the terrorist attack of October 7th, to hand over the terrorists who committed those atrocities for justice, and then Israel, of course, must immediately stop hostilities uh, and negotiate for peace, of course. I think this logic, this logic that you do what we want or we'll keep bombing you, it sounds exactly what a Hamas leader would say, because the number of dead on October 7th, that's been life in Gaza almost every year at the hands of Israeli bombardment. If you want to talk about hostages, look at the thousands of Palestinians held in military detention, often... Many of them who've attacked Israelis And many of them who have never been convicted of anything, including children and a woman in her 80s with Alzheimer's. If, if what you want to do is go down a road and go, OK, unless you do what we want... Do you agree there, that Hamas be, should hand back the hostages? Be, oh, should, they, should they hand back... Of course back? I do. That, and okay. there should, be, there so should let's also talk, be a let's call, call on them to do that. I haven't finished this thought. Right? If you keep going down this road, that violence can be endless until you do what we want, that is the exact same logic that you are doing. OK. Decrying. No, no, right, I'm no, saying no. Hamas should hand back the hostages. Do you agree with that? Uh, do you agree that they should withdraw the threat of repeating October 7th? I've said repeatedly yes. that there should be a ceasefire for hostages. But deal. should they withdraw the threat of repeating October the 7th? Should they hand back the hostages? Should they hand over the Why terrorists? Why are you repeating questions I've answered? You haven't Just answered. You've said technique. you've called for a ceasefire, but you haven't said that that's what they should do. For Hostages is what and should said. they hand over the terrorists who committed October 7th? I think that anyone who's committed war crimes, Hamas, IDF, okay. whoever should be held let's, accountable. Should I'm they be handed okay. in that position? Are you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's hear from Orsi. It's the man in the blue sweater there. How does anybody resolve the issue when the two main combatants won't negotiate? Okay, and the woman here. Um, I think there's an interesting. Well, it's difficult for any of us to have a solution to this problem it has been going on for decades, but I think there's a conversation to be had about what our government can do and how we're contributing to it still to this day and if that's right or not. But also, Robert, Ray's question is, is, has Israel gone beyond defending itself? Which begs the question, what would an appropriate response be if, if this is too far? What, what's your view on that? I mean, I don't have an answer to that question, but I think that our government should no longer have any involvement in it at all. I don't think... I, I agree that it's gone past self-defence and that we can't, we can't do it anymore. Douglas. 
Um, so what is the British government's position? We want an immediate ceasefire, we want a release of those hostages and we want immediate access to humanitarian workers and to humanitarian aid. The question is, the has conflict. Israel gone beyond defending itself? And let me itself. come directly to that question. The question is not, does Israel, in my mind, have the right to defend itself, but how Israel chooses to defend itself. Let's remember what happened on October the 7th for a moment. I shed no tears for Yaha Sinwar the so-called mastermind of October the 7th, the raping, the hostage-taking and the murder. He set a diabolic trap for Israel on October the 7th. And what we've seen is a direct consequence of the barbarism of October the 7th. That barbarism isn't a bridge to the liberation of the Palestinian people. It is a barrier to peace and reconciliation. And in their trauma, the Israelis have acted both in Gaza, now in Lebanon and more widely in the region. So what's our responsibility? We've said that we have withdrawn 30 export licenses for military equipment that was previously being sold because it could breach international humanitarian law in relation to Gaza. We've demanded that immediate ceasefire, although respectfully the gentleman is absolutely right. At the moment, the main protagonists in this conflict are less interested in peace than the rest of the world and seem intent on continuing the violence. So I think the right and responsible course for the British government is to continue to make the case, along with international partners, that the only ultimate resolution is a two-state solution. But in terms of the answer to the question, has Israel gone beyond defending itself? Well, that's a legal judgment. There are legal no, cases it's, it's underway. A matter, it's a matter, to it's also held. a matter of opinion. You've got, the, you've got people well, from the UN well, saying that they are, they are... And I, I'm not... I'm, hang meaning, on, hang on. I'm not, I'm not coming down on one side or the other, but you've got people... From, you've got the UNHCR, for example, saying they're appalled by the actions in northern yes. Gaza. That's not a legal judgment. That's an opinion. Is your opinion that Israel's gone yes, too I'm far? Yes, I'm horrified this... by the violence that we're witnessing, but what needs to happen? If Hezbollah is raining missiles down in Israel, any sovereign country would seek to defend itself. If we had suffered the scale of atrocity that Israel suffered on October the 7th, they would seek to... Do Palestinians have the right to, to self-defence, seeing as they're subject on, to occupation actually, in the West so, Bank, do they? So, actually, I'm, so, only because we've... I'm just going to get round... Just so let me answer that from question you. directly. The, the, the worth of a Palestinian child is exactly the same, in my mind, as that of an Israeli child. That is why the only resolution is to find a way back to politics, because ultimately we are witnessing horrendous killing on all sides at the moment. The man at the very back. Isn't this really about um, keeping the, the Israeli Prime Minister in power? Because as soon as the war stops, the hostages are returned and there's a peace treaty, he will be probably out of power, be ousted out of power. So isn't it really about keeping him in power, really? And in terms of the question of... of, of yes, there are a lot of people in Israel particularly who, who feel that. In terms of the question, has Israel gone beyond defending itself? What's your view on that? And, and Ash's point, say, for example, which you're basically saying on October the 8th, they should have started negotiating with Hamas. I think that there's an element of they should have targeted the terrorists, but done it in a more precise way. I think now just carpet bombing Gaza and now starting into Lebanon is just taking it far too far. They and when they say that the terrorists are, are amongst the civil population? I think we, you know, there's ways around that. I'm not, not a military expert, but there's probably ways around that and you don't need to get necessarily everybody. You just need to make a statement and then start negotiation. OK. Woman in the glasses. Yes. You have got your hand up, haven't you, now, with the glasses? Yes. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, I am a doctor here and I am a British-Palestinian who I have family in Gaza at the moment. Israel had, since after the 7th of October, been bombarding hospitals, killing children. There is a report just been released a few days by the New York Times of the 65 uh, hospital um, team who are healthcare workers who've been to Gaza in the last year and they detailed with evidence that Israeli soldiers, they've been targeting deliberately killing children directly in the head and in the chest. This is not self-defense anymore. I think Gaza been under the siege 17 years even before of the 7th of October. Israel has no self-defense because Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem is under the international law. And this is according the, okay. to the international uh, criminal justice that it is under occupation. 
and a country which is occupied, another country had no self-defense against okay. well, listen, the Palestinians. Let, let, me, let me just say, now, I, no, hang on, just hang on, just one minute. I just, want, no, I just want to ask you something. Hang on a second. So I can't verify what you're... I, I don't know about this New York Times report and I can't verify what you're saying. But let me just ask you the question which, which Ray has asked. You clearly do think Israel's gone beyond defending itself. You Definitely. think it's unconscionable. What do you think Israel should have done on the 8th of October? Israel should have done into negotiation with Hamas. We've been we've been in negotiation with Israel for the last 30 okay. years. We've been giving the land in return okay, of I hear safety you. I hear and your point. security of the Israelis. What has happened? Nothing. Okay. Israel, and do you, and do you think, the hang Oslo on, occurred, do you think, let do you me think, just please finish my okay. point. Since the Oslo occurred, 1994, Israel been annexing more land mm. in the West Bank, occupying Gaza. Okay. Yes, they withdraw from Gaza, but this, Gaza is still occupied by all their borders, by air, by everything <laughs> Palestinian in Gaza. They cannot leave. They didn't leave Gaza okay. for the last 17 right. years. Listen, I hear your passion and I totally understand why. Um, I just want to allow other, other people to speak as well. I'm not trying to shut you down. I just want to allow other people to speak as well. So you've got other, other hands up. Yes, the man... No, OK. OK, no, I, listen, I, I totally understand that you feel strongly about it and I understand why, but I do need to let other people speak as well, forgive me. Yes, the man here in the stripy T-shirt. You know, you mentioned that, like, um, that, that, that Israel is saying that there's terrorists in the community. If you're a child growing up in Palestine right now and you're seeing bombs being dropped left, right and centre, you don't grow up and think, oh, you know what, Israel, these are great people. They're just breeding the next generation of... So what do you think they should have done on the 8th of October? I think when there was a deal on... Well, I'm not massively clear, but there was a, there was a deal on the table in Qatar, was it? That, mm. that should have gone through. I, mean, I, I don't know the th details of it. There's disputes on both sides as to whether they would have accepted that deal. We, we, we can't yeah, be sure about but that. But I think at that point, it, that, was, that was, I think, for me anyway, that was the, the oh, OK, Damien. Um, th I... I I disagree with what I, I sense the sense of the room is uh, in that I think trying to paint Israel as the only villain in this is completely wrong. Uh, Israel uh, has been attacked by Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran. We haven't mentioned Iran mm. yet. Iran is firing ballistic missiles uh, into another country. What are the Israelis supposed to do about that? I think it's a very good question, not just what should Israel have done in October the 8th. And, and the idea of negotiating with Hamas on October the 8th is just ludicrous. If, if a thousand Brits uh, had been killed and raped and taken hostage, would we have said, OK, the day after, we're going to negotiate whoever <laughs> had done that? It's completely ridiculous. Now, absolutely, there are faults on both sides on this. But, but you have to remember that both he you know, Hezbollah have destroyed the Lebanese state. They have basically acted as a cuckoo in the nest and destroyed Lebanon. Hamas has done the same to, to Palestine, to Gaza. Uh, and the, uh, the problems there are, are at root uh, the Iranians mm. fighting a war across the Middle East against Western values in the widest sense. So uh, I do think uh, we need to step back a bit and say that you know, for whatever uh, complaints there are against Israel, and, and I get all of that, in the end, they are under attack, and they are under attack by people who want to attack our values as well, uh, and we should remember that. I think, actually, uh, there is just a glimmer of hope because of the killing of, of Sinyar. Uh, I, I agree with Douglas that uh, we should not mourn for him. And it is possible now, I think there may be space for the Israelis actually to start thinking about negotiation. We may look back on today as saying, OK, this was the point where we I mean, could move back into politics. Today they are saying they're going to keep on fighting Well, the they would say that today, well, but okay. I think... Hang on, Ash, hang on. We're never going to be... I've got to let other people talk as well. Yes. So I think, Ray, Ray, to your point, I think at the end of the day it's clearly heartbreaking every day since the 7th of October, and I think both governments have let down their populations. And we've got two very extreme governments that are, whether it's protecting their own, their own legacy uh, or, or just, you know, a delusional view as to where they are today, but clearly both governments are not protecting their populations. I'm concerned that the Biden conversation with Netanyahu took two months to happen. It's just recently happened. And, you know, generally, if we're going to make some progress here, the United States has to be the answer. Mm -hmm. So I would just urge our government to keep working very hard with the US to try and find resolution. OK, I'm going to move on. We will, of course, come back to this topic, I know. Um, I want to take a question on another topic that I think we may also come back to in the future. Theresa Moore. Hi. 
If the assisted dying bill is passed, how long will it be before we start coercing the most vulnerable in society to end their lives? Right, well, uh, a Labour MP has put forward uh, an assisted <coughs> dying bill. I think it was just yesterday. Uh, the details are yet to be finalised. It, it may be along the lines of a, a bill in the Lords where uh, the decision has to be made by two doctors and a High Court judge uh, if someone is terminally ill but has the capacity to make that decision. Ash? Um, so I think the point you're making is in reference to disability rights campaigners who've been saying that without adequate care provision, and there's not, hospice provision, palliative care, pet care is really patchy up and down the country, is that even if you do have safeguards, that you create an environment where for some disabled people, because care isn't accessible, you know, they get the message from the state that they're better off dead. And I really hear that. And I think that that needs to be listened to and reflected in whatever the proposal is. Um, th this is an issue where, where I really do see all sides of it. And, and I have time for everyone on every side of this debate. Um, but in, in March, uh, I lost a parent and the circumstances in which he died were really painful and really traumatic, both for him and for us. And witnessing that up close, I mean, I, d I don't know what he would have wanted, right? I don't know if he'd have taken up the offer of assisted dying if it was on the table or not. But witnessing that up close, it left me with the belief that people having more control over how and when they die is really, really important. And so while I hear those concerns, and I think they're really important and should be listened to, it should be reflected in the policy, those concerns, I am on the side of having some form of assisted dying in the UK, but with very strong protections. Douglas? Um, first of all, this is going to be a free vote and a conscience vote. It's not a matter of party politics, although Keir Starmer, the now Prime Minister, has said previously that he wants to allocate time in Parliament, because quite often these private members' bills, before they're finally decided, just get what's called talked out. So. I think we are facing a quite significant moment where this issue is coming to us. Where do I come to this as a person who's just returned to the House of Commons in July? Um, I'm really wrestling with it, is the honest answer. I think 10 years ago I would have opposed it. Um, I think that's partly reflective of just what I've learned and observed. I grew up in the church. My father was a Church of Scotland minister, my grandfather. I have a very deep respect for how the church has taught us, along with other faiths, the importance and equal worth of every human life, notwithstanding whatever impairments or disabilities individuals may have encountered. But I personally think we also need to recognise that the circumstances in which people are staying alive today, partly reflecting the conversation we've been having about modern drugs, is very different than the case even a few years ago. So I haven't yet made up my mind, but there's right. two dimensions. One is the moral dimension, what is the right thing to do? And secondly, what, is the, what are the practical considerations exactly to the lady's point in terms of avoiding coercion? I'm going to be giving a lot of detailed thought to this in the months ahead. Constantine. Well, I'm very much where Ash is, actually. I, I think this is such a difficult issue. I can totally foresee circumstances in which I would want that option to be available to me and to family and friends, of course. On the other hand, I think the lady's question is utterly correct, which is the slippery slope which is often a fallacy, actually, in public discussions, in this instance is absolutely not. You can totally conceive of circumstances where someone who is not terminally ill, but perhaps disabled in some way, we, we say, what about that? Someone is suffering with mental health that's perhaps uncurable. Someone's got clinical depression. What about that? And we quickly get to a position where we are encouraging, and we have seen this in countries like Canada, for example, where that the MAID Act there has been used far too excessively, in but my opinion. But there's still overwhelming public support for it. <laughs> Well, killing Up to eighty odd. Yeah, yeah, killing vulnerable people can be co supported quite widely. Well, no, by I'm, the not, I'm not saying that, but I'm just. I am uh, saying that. Okay, but I'm just saying that in Canada there is overwhelming public support for assistance. That health. doesn't mean it's the right thing to do when we're talking about a very vulnerable subset of the population. Is my point, and so I think what we have to do, if this goes ahead, which in, we don't know what the, the details of the bill are, that's part of the issue. We, if it goes ahead, and I'm reluctantly for that, we have to make sure that the protections against the point that you're making are incredibly strong. And this does not creep into allowing us to encourage people to kill themselves or encouraging their families to encourage them to do that. Now, 
I feel bad saying this because this is such an important subject. We have very little time left. I'm sure we are going to come back to it. But we've only got about three minutes left, so let, let me hear from both of you, Damien. OK. Um, I, 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 it has been voted on in the House of Commons before. Yes, uh, in 2015 when I was there, it was voted down. And I voted against it. Uh, I would pro I mean, I, I hear it. it's, it's an absolutely balanced point. You, you, we'll all be saying that. Um, I would probably vote against it again, partly on, on the, the difficult ethical grounds. I do think the slippery slope uh, might happen. But also on the practical grounds. I mean, it, as it's proposed, it's, it's two doctors and a judge. If this becomes fairly widespread, that is, you know, any doctor and any judge would take a huge amount of time to decide each of these individual decisions. Do we want to add that load to doctors and judges? And, and indeed, some of the doctors themselves have said, you cannot have a patient and then you're the doctor that administers the, no, they're the, suggesting the, it the drug be that kills them. It has to be a, se doctor, a separate yeah. doctor. So you'd have doctors whose only job was to uh, commit euthanasia. That feels very, very difficult to me. So, it's, so I think the ethics are very difficult, but also the practicalities okay. are separately difficult. Steve. So I think it's deeply personal. I hope nobody here has to make this decision. I hope I don't have to. That, that said, it's a well-trodden path in Canada and the Netherlands, about 10,000 people per country. I think this is exactly what our government should be debating. So we've had a lot of noise in the last few weeks, mm. but this is a real issue that a democracy can vote on, and I think it's good that we're tackling these type of issues. OK, I've got about a minute left. Yes, a man there. <coughs> oh, sorry, yes, OK, you go ahead. On a personal level, uh, I'm a healthcare uh, professional and also a parent that I had to sit and watch the high. So I'm, uh, I'm on both sides of it, but I haven't seen my mum die. Um, I think I am for you. You're for it. Yes, yeah. the man behind you? Um, I don't want to throw a curveball in on this, but in, there are situations where people are put under the uh, pressure of signing do not resuscitate orders. Now, I think what I find interesting is some people don't even know that these have been signed on their behalf. So I think there are fine lines between and who would decide, and there are no judges uh, involved in that, but probably nursing staff, where somebody's quality of life is decided upon. Mm. And coming back to what you were saying, you didn't know what your, bless you, your parent wanted, but knowing that would help. And it's very difficult. So I, I don't see the difference between what's been suggested as assisted dying and to a certain extent the do not resuscitate. I think there's a fine line between the two. Okay, it's about got, quality of life. I've got about 10 seconds left. Let's hear from the man in the, in the jacket there, yeah. So you have to be very brief, forgive um, me. Yeah, with greatest respect, we're a secular society and I think religion needs to be taken out of it completely. Religion and politics don't mix. Um, I think that... I mean, I'm very pro-choice on a lot of things. I think that people should be able to decide how they meet their end and I think it should have lots of limitations, absolutely. But I think this should have happened ten years ago. I okay. think this is a long time in, in, in coming. OK, well, I'm sure we will come back to this debate again. It's only just come before the House of Commons and has several stages to go through yet. So that is all for this week. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you to our audience here in Rotherham. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you to you at home for watching. Next week, don't forget, we are in Plymouth. And um, also let me remind you, we're on the iPlayer from 8 o'clock every Thursday if after 10 o'clock news is a bit too late. Anyway, we shall see you next week. Thanks very much.